morning. Thank you, Cal. Uh, Callum, that was a wonderful introduction, and thanks so much, Disa, and everybody from the Marion Institute for making this such a spectacular event. I really think it was an act of genius to have it in downtown New Bedford, don't you? Yeah. That's terrific. Well, it's great to be here. A friend tells the story of a five-year-old who's usually fidgeting and restless in class. And suddenly the teacher notices that she's deeply absorbed in a drawing, focused. The teacher comes by. I'm not sure why she interrupted this reverie, but she says, what are you drawing? And the young girl says, it's going to be a picture of God. And she says, wow. And the teacher says, but nobody even knows what God looks like. And this little girl looks up and says, in a minute, they will. <laughs> we're, starting, we're starting to look at the future in a way that we really haven't needed to before or haven't. We don't know what it looks like, but perhaps in a few minutes here together we can take a look at what some parts of it should look like. We're in the midst of a cascade of truly spectacular events. Several years ago, Al Gore released An Inconvenient Truth. About the same time, Tom Friedman, mainstream New York Times columnist, best-selling foreign, foreign affairs author, saw the green light and began to write about climate change and energy extensively, culminating with the release of his recent book, Hot, Flat, Flat and Crowded, Why We Need a Green Revolution and How It Can Renew America. He says it will be the greatest innovation project in American history. Venture capital, as Kenny mentioned yesterday, has shifted its focus from software and internet to green tech. Oil prices shot up this year, we all felt it. Climate change and energy suddenly became a high-level presidential campaign issue never before. And after we allowed a childish financial elite to run the global economy with little adult supervision and run amok, Wall Street was finally unmasked, its pyramid schemes revealed, and we've watched it crumble. Now with that, the impossible global economy that we've built became wobbly. We're at a convergence of staggering proportions. None of this came without warning, none of it came without predictions. A few intrepid economists have pounded this drum, but nobody, as far as I know, expected it to happen so soon. We're seeing all the bad things that we thought would happen. Our country is experiencing more mood swings than a teenager. But it's all a prelude. It's a prelude to all the good things we know must come next. And we best be ready because as economist Paul Romer recently said, a crisis is a terrible thing to waste. So what does? What does happen next after we switch off the alarm clock that's insistently telling us loud and clear that the first industrial age is over and done? How will we be certain not to waste this terrible crisis? Certainly Obama's election, a little more than a week from now, will say something encouraging, even exhilarating, about the current state of mind of the American people. It will remind us who we always thought we were and perhaps return us to the principle of terrain of our revolutionary roots. Maybe, just maybe. The next thing is the beginning of the reindustrialization of America, but of a fundamentally different sort. The first industrial age caused us to spread our carbon footprint across the planet and cover it. The next will be designed to reduce to a fraction of what it is today. I have great hopes, but there's something about all this that I'm worried about. And it's about me. Each time I read about the exploding economies of China and India and the resources they may consume to emulate the American way, I wonder why, why I don't devote the rest of my life, every waking hour, to working on the issue of climate change. I worry that I don't change the way I live more significantly. Change is hard. I loved my Toyota Land Cruiser and drove it a quarter million miles. But after 9-11, when the bumper stickers with a picture of Osama saying thank you for driving your SUV started to appear, I felt I just had to switch and I bought a hybrid so 
you know, now I only support terrorism when I'm driving uphill. But <laughs> change is hard and unsettling. Not long ago, I was in Maine at a wonderful company that I'm sure some of you are familiar with called Johnny Selected Seeds, which is currently in the midst of an employee ownership transition. The CEO, Mike Comer, was taking me for a tour of the company, showing me all the things they're changing as they become more and more a true 21st century company. And I asked him, how are the employees reacting to all this change? And he said, oh, there's a broad spectrum of reaction. It goes from being against it to being really against it to being really, really against it. <laughs> but change is coming. I mean, that's the way we humans are. But change is coming. Whether we're against it or not, now's a time when we must insist on the future we want and need, either that or we'll let a different future happen to us against our will. One way or another, there will be change. None of us can do it all. All of us can do something. And maybe it's more than we think. At South Mountain Company, the design, build, and renewable energy company I founded in 1975 that's been owned and operated by its employees for the past two decades, one of our goals is to make all operations carbon neutral in 10 years. We really have not fully defined what that means yet for us and the depth of that, but we're moving toward the goal nonetheless. Today we heat our building and run our forklifts with biodiesel, which we make ourselves. 25% of our electricity is generated on site. By the end of this fall, that will, that will become 90%. In our work, we're moving closer and closer and sometimes reaching this goal of net zero energy houses. And even our subsidized affordable housing, which is a large part of our work, is built this way to make sure that it's forever affordable. But so what? How does our fumbling little drop in the bucket matter? It gives us hope. Vaclav Hamel, the former Czech president, says this about hope. Hope is not the same as joy that things are going well or willingness to invest in enterprises that are obviously headed for early success, but rather an ability to work for something because it's good, not just because it stands a chance to succeed. Hope is not the conviction that something will turn out well, but the certainty that something makes sense regardless of how it turns out. That's the reason we do what we do. The conviction that it makes sense regardless of its modest impact. Now at its core, of course, climate change, perhaps the most vexing issue humankind has ever faced, is not a technical problem. To change our relationship to the earth, we change our relationship to each other. And we must change our definition of success so that it's less about doing and making as much as we can, as fast as we can, and more about satisfying human needs as elegantly and effectively as we can, about thinking about more, about thinking about enough rather than thinking about more. Our future will require us to transform our economy one drop at a time and political transformation. How many of you have read Peter Barnes' book, Climate Solutions? I can't see what you I can't see you, but I know you're out there. Um, <clears throat> thank you. <clears throat> it's a gem, and it lays out in 81 pages what we need to do politically to tackle the problem. It lays out the recipe. It tells how to manage the sky as a commons to auction emission permits and use the income to serve the public good. The mechanism he suggests is the Earth Atmosphere Trust, which would create a global institution that makes the sky a trust. The trust would auction a declining number of carbon permits each year and deposit those proceeds in a global fund. And a portion of the one to four trillion dollars that would be earned each year would be returned to everyone on Earth on a per capita basis. Now these payments would be insignificant to the rich, but enough to lift the poor out of poverty and the remaining money would pay for renewable energy projects and climate change mitigation. Such global transformation will require more than political will and more than investment. It will require collaboration of a type and scale heretofore unknown. We'll need new tools, new abilities, new ways of working together, and new forms of governance and business. All of us will need to own the endeavor. New form, a central requirement for the journey 
may be the ability to own our workplaces and share responsibility for the outcomes of our work, good and bad. And that takes me from the global wilderness to the tiny garden that I've played in for 35 years, my life in business, and to the heart of this talk, the idea that our future is a design issue and we need to redesign our companies as cooperatives, social enterprises, and employee-owned businesses. I was rummaging through some old papers recently and I found this letter dated December 16, 1968, 40 years ago. And the letter reads, Dear John, when you have the $15 that you owe me from the time I bought the grass from you, you can send it to Ann Viber at 642 East 11th Street, New York City. This was before zip codes. And it goes on to say, I expect this sounds like a pressure type note. It's not meant to be. Just send it when you have it. Thanks. Sincerely, Ann Vibert. And I had never come across this before, and when I read it, I thought, well, I've got the money now. I should pay back my debt. So I, I searched on the Internet and found only one Ann Vibert that seemed to fit. She's a professor at Acadia University in Nova Scotia and seemed to be about the right age. So I popped a $100 bill in an envelope, a little interest. This is business after all. And uh, sent it off with a copy of the letter. And a week or so later, the letter came back with the $100 bill in it and a note that said, John, much as I appreciate the gesture and as much delight as it broke, brought to my day, I'm afraid I can't cl lay claim to the identity of the apparently other Ann Vibert. In 1968, I was 13 and living in a small town in Nova Scotia where grass was still only something to mow. Keep searching, she'll be thrilled. <laughs> and it was signed, Ann Vibert, the other one. But the question here is, if I sold her the pot, why did I owe her the money? And I think it may be just a parable for my career in business. Maybe. But I've been lucky, and things have gone well. In 1987, I restructured the company from a sole proprietorship under my ownership to an employee-owned cooperative corporation. It was a dramatic hinge point in the history of the company. Ownership became available to all employees, enabling people to own and guide their workplace. The responsibility, the power, and the profits all belong to the group of owners. There are no outside investors, no non-employee owners, and we decide what kind of business ours will be. The decisions are partly economical and partly philosophical and partly emotional. At the time of the restructuring, the full implications of what I was doing were not apparent to me. I was frightened but energized. I didn't know where this path would lead. Tremendous rewards and benefits derived from that decision for me and for the company. I have the best job I can imagine, due largely to the colleagues who share ownership and share this ride with me. I still get to own it, partly. I still get to run it, partly. And I still, and, and yet, I'm freed from responsibility, from full responsibility, partly. So two decades later, I am fully convinced that the conversion to employee ownership has been a critical factor in the long-term modest success of our company. Employee ownership is emerging from beneath the radar. There's an awakening interest in the potential of broadly shared ownership of enterprise. The idea is beginning to surface all over the world in companies large and small. Today, over 11,000 companies nationally, with 8.5 million employees, have some form of employee ownership. Most of these do not share our cooperative model, and most do not distribute power as much as they do money, but all indicate that we may be learning something fundamental. Some of you, along with the rest of my fellow American baby boomers, own several million businesses right now, and during the next two decades, most of the founders will depart. In 2001, 50,000 businesses were sold in this, in this country. In 2005, that number rose to 350,000, and projections call for 750,000 in 2009. These will generally be sold outside the community. They will generally um, change their character. Um, they will generally leave the area where they are. All kinds of things happen with these businesses when they're sold, but passing on a business to its employees is an option 
that deserves to be more widely understood, for it offers powerful benefits to all parties. It is in part a replacement for the family tradition of passing businesses along, and it's becoming <clears throat> an important entity of choice. It's all about the recognition that when the people who are making the decisions bear the responsibility for the consequences of those decisions and also share in the rewards that derive, better decisions will result. It's about building true community within the workplace and deep connections to the communities where we work and live. Now, curbing corporate abuse, reigning in the global corporate juggernaut and mobilizing to grapple with climate change, these are largely dependent on the political transformation that Barnes recommends, but politics is a crapshoot where the dice may not fall the way we wish, and we can only have a minor impact on that political process, but our democracy offers us other choices. While we work toward political solutions, we have the liberty to invent the corporation of the future right now. We can make whatever kinds of companies and organizations we want, nothing stands in our way. Owning our work and finding meaning there is as essential to a good life as it is to own our homes. When the employees who live in the community and are part of the civic landscape are making the decisions, it's less likely that the business will be sold, more likely that it will stay rooted in place, and there's more incentive to be a positive force in the community. We're part of the place that we're raising our children, and we have a long-time commitment to it. Community accountability is woven into the fabric of the structure. Employee ownership empowers. It promises deeper connections, greater commitment, increased productivity. A friend of mine, Robert Lieber, has taught me something about power that transcends, I think, the way we mostly think about power. Most people think that power is like a pie. If I give you a slice, you now have some and I have some less. But power, as Robert says, is infinite. If we distribute power, there's not less for us. There's just more of it, more available for everyone to use. And employee ownership extends power to each and every one of us, expanding the power, simple as that. In our case, a key element is hiring future owners as opposed to employees. We envision people who enter the company staying and leading it forward. We don't know what they, as the perpetuators, will do or produce, but the essence of our collective enterprise will survive in them as they travel into a future that we can't even imagine. So we're not always looking for people with specific skill sets. We can teach what we need to. We're looking for the kind of people we wish to share ownership with. This is attractive. It attracts people. It attracts wonderful people because ownership is a very big deal. Someone once said, and I think it was Tom Friedman, that in the history of mankind, Nobody has ever washed a rental car. <laughs> Ownership is a big deal. To think and act differently, though, and to dream differently, we need to think about these enterprises like cathedral builders. British business philosopher Charles Handy gives perspective to this remark. Cathedrals inspire, he says. It's not only their grandeur or splendor, but the thought that they often took more than 50 years to build. Those who designed them, those who first worked on them, knew for certain they would never see them finished. They knew only that they were creating something glorious which would stand for centuries long after their own names had been forgotten. We may not need any more cathedrals, he says, but we do need cathedral thinkers, people who can think beyond their own lifetimes. At South Mountain, our long-term commitment to the small island community where we work leads us to expect that the work that we have begun will continue for generations, will never be done, much like the people who worked on cathedrals knew that they would never see them completed. But nothing's all peaches and cream. Our struggle with our values is ongoing. Constant adjustments are necessary. There's a story about Abe Lincoln when he was still practicing law in Springfield, Illinois, and representing a client who was fighting the railroad. A friend approached Lincoln's office on Main Street, and he saw a man coming, come flying out of Lincoln's first floor window, hit the ground, brush himself off, and get up and run down the street. And so the friend rushed in to see what had happened. I threw him out the window, Lincoln said. Well, why, what did he do, asked the friend. 
Well, he's the lawyer for the railroad, and he offered me 5000 to betray my client. But I turned him down, and then he offered me 10000 I turned him down again, and finally, he offered me $15,000, and I tossed him out the window. And the friend said, well, why did you choose that moment? Because, Lincoln said, he was getting close to my price. <laughs> the lure of greater financial success is strong. It's hard to forego, and sometimes it comes close to our price. But more than 30 years after our seat of the pants beginnings with 33 employees and 8 to 9 million in annual revenues, we're still small enough to stay closely connected to our roots, to do business on a handshake, to all gather in one small room, to know each other as people and not only as co-workers, to recognize one another as collaborators in pursuit of multiple goals. Living this structure has shaped an incredibly dedicated, skillful, compassionate body of decision makers. Nobody's getting rich, but we are living comfortably doing the work we enjoy in the location of our choice. All of us are able to make good livelihoods because no one of us is getting rich. Our fundamental, propose, prop, our fundamental purpose is to use our business to create good products, good lives, and a strong community, and to profitably employ the economy in the service of that well-being. Now, as we mature, we're beginning to see the spirit of cooperative enterprise grow and flourish worldwide. In the Emilia-Romagna region of northern Italy, which is the province that surrounds the city of Bologna, thousands of small businesses are the heart of an energetic manufacturing economy, and businesses are finding that they can cooperate for a general rather than an individual benefit. Small businesses in the same line of work, which would normally be competitors, have begun to pool resources for, general buy, for greater buying power and for control over particular industrial processes and for shared distribution. Everyone benefits, and small companies gain some of the advantages that are usually available only to large companies. These collaborative methods have helped this district become one of the most dynamic and prosperous economic regions in the world. Home to four million people, there is virtually full employment and a per capita income 50% above the national average. And at the core of this strikingly successful economy is thousands, literally thousands, of employee-owned cooperatives who have a strong collaborative relationship and a strong relationship with the regional government. Now, this whole cooperative and employee ownership movement is clearly just a distant blip on a broad horizon, but it is working at all scales, gathering steam, and generating interest. The cooperative structure can be used in many ways. The International Cooperative Alliance estimates there are more than 800,000 cooperatives worldwide, serving over 730 million members. The ICA's list of the world's largest, the Global 300, includes familiar names like Ocean Spray and the Associated Press. There are producer cooperatives like the agricultural co-ops found all over the country, Organic Valley, Cabots in Vermont are well-known examples. And there are consumer co-ops, of which REI in Seattle is the, probably the largest and best known. And there, there are worker co-ops like South Mountain. As a business, we feel that our community is our primary client, and it's our job to serve that community as well as it serves us. We're deeply involved in its future in many ways. And one of the most exciting endeavors beginning in our community now is another co-op, very different from ours, a combination producer-consumer co-op called Vinergy. On Martha's Vineyard, as in most places, almost every dollar we spend on electricity goes to distant investor-owned utilities, and often from them to the rest of the world, at the same time, we have no control over the price of this essential commodity. Vinergy is to be a community-owned electric utility which proposes to build, own, and operate renewable energy generation and to distribute directly and or sell the power generated for the sole benefit of its cooperative member owners, the residents of Martha's Vineyard. The goal is to enlist all Vineyard Energy users as members, to minimize and stabilize the price of electricity for members, to ensure a reliable, locally controlled supply of electricity for members, to convert two-thirds of all local energy use to renewables, and to eliminate 90% of our island's carbon footprint. 
This will keep significant funds within the island economy instead of allowing it to leak or flood off-island and make high-paying, rewarding year-round jobs in engineering, meteorology, design, financing, environmental assessment, construction, etc., and keep them locally. Good jobs. Good jobs doing good. Do you find it unsettling, as I do, that for decades now, tens of thousands of our brightest people have chosen to work in hedge funds, in investment banks, in private equity firms, and produce nothing, absolutely nothing, except money. I mean, whatever became of physics and medicine and manufacturing and architecture, and now it turns out that these bright people were so greedy and heedless that their judgment was way out of whack. So how did we get here? Is it because the lack of meaning and ownership in our work drives us to want to make money rather than anything else? Margaret Kelly, the former publisher of Business Ethics Magazine, says that for many people, the endless cycle of work and consumption leaves them feeling dead inside, unsatisfied, alienated from what really matters. Could we alter this dynamic? I want to suggest a new mechanism to bring about widespread employee ownership. William Grider in The Soul of Capitalism calls the Homestead Act of 1862, which awarded free land if the recipients worked it and stayed on it to more than half a million American families. He calls it a public works project of grandly egalitarian intent that was probably the nation's single greatest stroke of economic development channeled directly through people. He goes on to say, in present times, some advocates suggest a parallel between employee ownership and homesteading. Instead of land, government, it's argued, should provide access to capital to finance the broadened distribution of equity ownership, capital that workers could repay from their enterprises return. So my hope is something I want from our next president, Barack Obama. Uh, it's easy to say that in this room. I hope he will propose the Workstead Act of 2010. About 4 million Americans are born each year. If at birth $20,000 were invested for each baby, it would become 100000 at age 25. This fund would be available to each young citizen to invest in the business of their choice after becoming an employee. It's like the opposite of a golden parachute. It's a platinum launch to good purpose. How good would it be for American business, for capitalism, if every new employee was an investor? How good would it be for our business, for business, if our children were the new source of venture capital? If they were, what would they invest in? Do you think, as I do, that they would want to own businesses they believe in, businesses designed to make a better world? And if many did, this would be a change of epic proportions, a change to the fundamental chemistry of our culture. I hope to see the day. I hope you do too. But will we ever have enough money ever again to do good things like this? Of course we will. We already do, despite what the headlines may lead us to believe. Will we bear witness to and participate in the appropriate redistribution of wealth so it serves us all? Is this too much to ask? As an old fisherman once said to his young charge, when you fish in this life, Always use a big hook, because even if you catch nothing, it's more exciting to not catch a big fish than to not catch a small one. <laughs> no, it's not too much to ask for. It's not too much to fish for. Although hope and optimism are not the currencies of the day, I look around me and I see wonderful ideas and forces stewing at the edges of our culture like everything that we're seeing here at this event. A mosaic of new institutions and approaches is emerging and making inroads. As we unpack these tools and concepts, we're changing the future. As social entrepreneur Paul Hawken recently said, and I'm paraphrasing so this might not get it quite right, he said, if you take a hard look at the evidence, all the evidence, and you're not pessimistic, then you're not looking at the evidence. But if you look at the wonderful things that individuals are doing worldwide in the face of the data and you're not optimistic, then you haven't got a pulse. I don't pretend to know how much we can build on the foundations we've created 
or to what extent our experience in business can help others toward a path to economic democracy, environmental restoration, and local community involvement, but it makes no sense to me to dwell on all that's so wrong unless we recognize equally all that is so right. I believe in the essential goodness of people, right, left, and middle. And I have a deeply embedded sense that if we are encouraged sufficiently, we'll choose to care about the common good. There's a Chinese saying that I love, that man stands for a long time with mouth open before roast duck flies in. We can't wait. There's nothing to keep us from building those cathedrals except ourselves. Gathered here today, this weekend, we're all encouraging and inspiring each other to use a big hook so that we may be able to invent a future that we can all embrace. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you all.